I'm Madonna. <laughs> I guess you know when you're in love when you finally decide that you want to make sacrifices for somebody else or you want to give something up for somebody else or you don't just concentrate on yourself. I think like the love that parents have for their children. Dad! Madonna, I think it's time we get going here. Get going where, Dad? We gotta go. We got some homework to do and things to do. Dad, I graduated from high school. But you're pretending. Twelve years ago. Pretending what? You're pretending that you're a movie star and you're really not. I am a movie star. Once, once we got older and and um, and uh, we could drive ourselves. We, my, my father, um, my parents would go to the earlier mass, and we'd say we're going to go to the later one. We'd all get in the car together, and we'd go down to the donut shop, and then we'd go to church and pick up like a flyer, like we'd been there, you know, and uh, we'd make up something that the priest said during the sermon. And I think my father knew all along that we were lying. Well, I don't think she lied to me, but she didn't oh, always yeah, give me the full right truth. <laughs> she probably did. I probably Most see, kids do. He's so loyal, he won't say anything bad about me. <laughs> the thing is, if my father hadn't been strict, I wouldn't be who I am today. And I think, um, um, I think that his strictness taught me a certain amount of discipline that has helped me in my life and in my career and also um, made me work harder for things, whether that's acceptance or um, the privilege to do something. Yeah, my nickname in, in, in my family was The Mouth. When, there is a big, when, you're, in, when you're from a big family, everybody's really competitive with each other. So um, aside from just screaming really loud and doing things that got me attention like, oh, Oh, you know, we would all get in various kinds of trouble to get my father's attention and then um, be punished accordingly. But I think uh, I was really competitive in school with my grades and stuff. My father used to um, give us rewards if we got A's, like all A's on our report card. And so it was my, my goal to get the best report cards all the time. It wasn't so much that I was interested in learning. It was more that I was interested in getting the best grades and, you know, getting the most. My father gave us... 25 cents for every A that we got. So um, I wanted to earn the most amount of money. I wanted to be the envy of my brothers and sisters. Well, everyone in the family um, studied a musical instrument. My father was really big on that. Somehow, I only took about a year and a half of piano lessons, and I convinced my father to let me take dancing lessons instead. Mm. So I escaped the dreariness of piano lessons every day, which I despised. So. Um, but there was always music in our house, either practicing or records or the radio or someone singing in the bathtub or noise, lots of noise. <laughs> this last one, Express Yourself, I've had the most amount of input. I oversaw everything, the building of the set, everyone's costume. I had meetings with makeup and hair and the cinematographer and, you know, everybody. Casting, finding the right cat, just every aspect. Yeah. Yeah, kind of like making a little movie. We basically sat down and just threw out every idea we could possibly conceive of. Mm -hmm. And of all the things we wanted, all the imagery we wanted, and I had a few set ideas. For instance, the cat. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of Metropolis, I was, a, you know, definitely wanted to have that, that influence, that look on all the men, the workers, so. sort of diligently, methodically working away um, David, David's idea for the cat to like lick the milk and then pour it over, sense. it's great. And believe me, I, I mean, I have to, um, I fought him on that. I didn't want to do it. I thought, oh, it's just so over the top and silly and kind of cliche, like art, art student or film student kind of trick, you know, but I'm glad that I gave in to him. The ultimate thing behind the song is that if you don't express yourself, if you don't say what you want, then you're not going to get it. And in, a, in, a, in effect, you are chained down by your inability to say what you feel or go after what you want. 
lots of times Pat Leonard will come up with um, a piece of music like Oh Father. We did very little to change it musically, and he throws the music at me, and I just listen to it over and over again, and, and somehow the music suggests words to me, and I just just start writing the words down. Mm -hmm. Other times I will come to Pat with a, a an idea for a song, either lyrically or emotionally, and say, let's do something like this, or I'll have a melody line in my head, which I will sing to him, and he will sort of pound out the chords to. I mean, it, it takes a, long, a lot longer to do it that way because I don't play an instrument, but ultimately it's a, it's a lot more personal. And then Steve Bray, it's the same thing. Sometimes he'll come up with a track and he'll have a verse and a chorus, but he won't have a bridge, so we'll write the bridge musically together. I think that, um, you know, Prince was a very isolated life, and I don't, and that is the big difference yeah. between us. And I just try to be a positive influence on him. I've always been a fan. I think he's incredible, and I also admire his... He's very courageous, and he um, causes lots of controversy, too, which is great, and I think he is a brilliant musician. Uh, and we'd gotten together a couple of times, you know, in the hopes of working with each other in, in some way. Either originally we were going to do a musical together, and we were going to write the music for it, and that didn't really pan out. You know what I mean? We just kept getting together, and he, I, he seemed to fight the idea of just writing songs for a record together because he's done that with so many people. He came to see me in the play I did last summer in New York, and he just, for the hell of it, put together a tape of some rough things that, that he had done in all of our meetings that we had had. And Love Song was one of the songs, and I just said, you know, this is crazy. It's such a great song. Why, why not put it on the record? And... Um, it seemed to relate to all the other songs because it's about a relationship that, that's, you know, a hate-love relationship. And so he agreed to it, and we kind of sent the tapes back and forth to each other, and we'd keep building it. It was like he would write a sentence, and I would add on to it, and then send it back to him, and he would continue the story, you know, basically. It was fun. Because in this song, really, it is only my musical influence. And his, like, I didn't have Pat or Steve's help. I played the keyboards myself, and um, and uh, it, because I know don't know that much, it kind of came out strange and interesting. It was about innocence versus decadence, really, and in the end, I chose innocence. I mean, that's what the child represented. You know, the childlike quality that everybody has versus the, all the people in the club who, you know, sort of were jaded and decadent and depraved, you know. The other side of life that I'm interested sure. in. My first boyfriend was when I was, uh, I guess, gee, I think 14 or 15. I fell in love with a boy named Russell. He was the only boy who would dance with me at school because I was really wild at, at the high school dances. And um, I danced completely insanely, and every all the guys were afraid to ask me to dance with them because I basically ignored them anyways. Mm -hmm. So, um, but Russell was a wild dancer, and he was a couple years older, so he was more sophisticated. And um, so he was, uh, he was the one who had the courage, really. So he won my heart, because he wasn't afraid of me. I can't remember what I saw first, Elton John or David Bowie, but I was, I was punished for seeing both of them because Kobo Arena was a, a really dangerous part of downtown Detroit, and it really wasn't a place for young girls to be going unescorted, which we all were. So, um, so uh, I think I lied to my father and said I was spending the night at my girlfriend's, and then I went off to the concerts, and both times my father called and found that I wasn't there and found out that I'd gone to the concert. And um, I think I got grounded or something. And I had to like, like one summer I wanted to go away to camp or something and I, I wasn't allowed to because I went to see David Bowie. But they were both, it was worth it. I borrowed a long black, like velvet cape from my girlfriend. Who knows what I had underneath it. Um, but I made a, a grand entrance and that, that was the most important thing. <laughs> ideas 
about God, and then I had um, the ideas that I thought were imposed on me. Like, I believe in God. I believe that everything you do comes back to you. Mm -hmm. I think I believe in the innate goodness of people and the importance of that. People who are really, if they're really passionate and they really are, have an open mind, and they really watch closely, I think that the video has a very positive message and that they wouldn't find fault with it. The, the passion is, it, there's something almost sexual about it, really. I mean, if you want to get really psychoanalytical about it. Um, but, you know, the, the, the video was very, um, I, I think it had a very positive message. Right. It was about, it was about um, overcoming racism and overcoming the fear of, of, of telling the truth, of getting, you know, so many people witness crimes and they're, mm -hmm. they're afraid to get involved Absolutely. because it will only bring them trouble. They're afraid to stand out on a limb and stand up for someone else. And I think it had a lot of positive messages. I mean, it's a very taboo subject to have an interracial relationship, you know what I mean? Um, and the idea of that kind of joyousness in the church, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it dealt with a lot of taboos, and, um, and it made people afraid. And I think the people who reacted negatively to it were afraid of their own feelings that they have about those issues. I have to listen to um, the criticism that I get when, it's, when they're dealing with my, with my work. And uh, it's beneficial. I, I guess I don't take criticism very well. But it's getting better. And if I do something and everybody, and there's 100 people in the room and 99 people say they liked it, I only remember the one person who didn't like it. Well, the thing is, I, I, I wouldn't even be blonde now, except that I'm dating Dick Tracy and yeah. I had to dye my hair blonde. But I, I was, I begged, I begged Warren Beatty to let me have dark hair because it took me so long to grow my hair out and I really wanted to have dark hair. I felt like I was, you know, along with the album, which was much more personal and stuff, I, I felt kind of great. Um, having my own hair color for the first time in years. There was something exotic to me about having dark hair versus blonde hair, and then I had to change it, so it was a little bit... I had a bit of an identity crisis, because that's the, the avenue I was going down, and then all of a sudden I had to change it, so... Women with blonde hair are perceived as much more sexual and much more um, kind of impulsive, not so serious, fun, fun-loving, you know what I mean, but not as, not as layered, not as deep, not as serious. I really want to be recognized as an actress. Mm -hmm. I've learned that, that if you surround yourself with, a, you know, great writers and great actors and a great director and a great um, costume or whatever, that it's pretty hard to go wrong. And in the past, I've been in, the, in a really big hurry to make movies, you know what I mean, and I haven't kind of taken the time to make sure that all of those elements were in line and, wow. and good and now. And uh, if Warren's taught me anything, it's that, and that is to be patient and only, it's a waste of time to do something mediocre. Mm -hmm. That unless you absolutely believe in it 100% in every aspect, that you shouldn't waste your time. Uh, I don't take drugs myself. Um, um, I've experimented, but they just don't do anything for me. My imagination and my energy level is, um, overdeveloped as far as I'm concerned. I don't want to deaden it and I don't want to make it something different. I don't need, I don't want to alter my state of mind, but um, I know that lots of people have, are very creative if they're smoking grass or, um, or have been, you know, or dropping acid or something. I don't understand that because it doesn't work for me. Um, obviously, I'm not condoning, uh, you know, someone to uh, take drugs, you know, and, I've watched a lot of people kill themselves taking drugs on, whether it's heroin or coke, ruin their, their careers, their lives, their, their families, their relationships. I think ultimately drugs destroy, destroy you. They take away your natural ability to be creative or um, love yourself, uh, deal with people, communicate, whatever. And it seems maybe in the beginning that they help that, that they aid it, that they enhance it, but ultimately they destroy it. Wow. So, I think it's better just to uh, um, not take drugs. <sighs> there's a lot of terrible things happening in the world today, and there's a lot of people that need our help, and there's a lot of environmental issues that need to be dealt with. But um, in terms of, you know, AIDS, 
I've just I've just known so many people that have died of AIDS, and it's such a serious problem. And like so much, so much of the art community in New York, you know what I mean? I, I, I feel like in five years from now, all, all of my friends will be dead in, in a way. Um, and it really hits home with me. It's, it's a very serious matter. And then the Brazilian rainforest, like I said, the night of the um, performance, the, uh, the benefit performance, I didn't think that it was such a, a personal issue for me. I didn't think it was a, such a big deal until I got all the facts about it, you know. And it really is, I mean, more than, you know, the threat of a nuclear war, which may or may not happen, you know, if we destroy the rainforest, we are destroying ourselves, and it's happening right now. And um, in, you know, in 50 years, the entire rainforest will be gone, and we need, you know, we need the rainforest for oxygen. We need the rainforest to um, absorb the carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere from all the cars and all the pollution. And we need the forest to um, help find cures for AIDS and cancer, which is an important issue for me. Um, my mother died of cancer. My best friend died of AIDS. So um, it's a really, you know, vital, important <coughs> issue. Anything else I'd like to say? Um, I don't know. Peace. Peace, man. Make love, not war. That's all. Madonna, come down off that stage this instant. Daddy, is that you? You're coming home with me right now, young lady. But Daddy, I'm having a good time. You heard what I said. Dad! <laughs> Hello, I saw a wild child. Thank you.